Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and I am standing in front of Ahu Alai Ao, which uh, used to be known as Fisher 8 three years ago when it was spewing lava hundreds of feet into the air and basically laying waste to this whole neighborhood. Um, it is an amazing and f weird place to be with a uh, wreckage and um, just new earth underneath it. It's three years old, this this rock that I'm standing on. This, well, it's not even rock, it's just compressed uh, spatter, you know, tephra is what they call it. Yeah, let's explore. When I was in Hawaii a couple of months ago, one of the places I really wanted to explore was this. This is known as Fisher 8. It is one of many uh, lava fissures that opened up in the middle of the neighborhood of Leilani Estates. A lot of those uh, in those trees next to this area, you can see houses. Some of them butt up right against the lava field, but Fisher 8 was the largest of many. It would ultimately throw out hundreds of thousands of tons of lava that would flow eight miles to the sea and create new areas of land. During the two months it was active, this fissure emitted more lava than the rest of the mountain does in five years. And it drained so much lava out of the mountain that the reserves were depleted to the extent that essentially it brought an end to an eruption which had been ongoing since the 1980s. And now, years after the activity has stopped, it's possible for adventurous people to go and visit this area that was once a community. You can climb to the top of this fissure, which was laid down and built up by the eruption from it. But first, I want to rewind the clock and talk about the geophysics, the geology that drove this eruption. I'd previously visited the Big Island of Hawaii in 2018, and there had been some significant changes to the way Kilauea was erupting. There was a, a lava lake at the top of the mountain in Hale Uma'u crater. This was unusual. Since 1983, most of the eruption had occurred through a vent called Pu'u'o'o, which was further down to the east. But something had changed and the lava was backing up and reaching the top of the mountain. You have to understand that underneath the volcano there are channels and reservoirs where molten magma collects and moves around. So with magma being pushed up to the top of the mountain that increased the pressure and that forces some of these channels around apart and you start getting cracks forming which cause earthquakes and eruptions. And there was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake which uh, be, seemed to be the major trigger for everything. To give you an idea of how big an effect this was, this diagram shows you how far the land moved on the surface. And in places, the island moved several metres southwards in a time measured in seconds. And that unblocked the channels the lava was using to move around. And in the lower east rift zone, cracks began to open, emitting steam and then later lava. And interestingly, the first lava that came out was very thick and sticky and slow moving. And this was because it was actually magma from a 1950s eruption. There had been an eruption in the area and it had stopped, but some of the magma was still sitting underground, slowly cooling. But now this new eruption was happening, it was getting pushed out. And eventually, the slow moving lava would be replaced by fresh, fast moving lava. And that lava was actually being fed from the top of the mountain. That lake that I had seen up there was sinking down into the mountain, draining out through a location far to the east. And without the mass of that lava supporting the top of the mountain, it then began to collapse in on itself and the crater got larger and larger, destabilizing the crater rim. And that meant that the Jagger Museum and Volcanic Observatory, which was on the rim, is now closed. This is a, a video I took in 2018 from the lookout there. This is now closed and actually that crater behind them would be completely collapsed in. So I love Volcanoes National Park. It is amazing, but I wanted to find a more raw and uncurated experience. And so I drove down to Lilani Estates. I found uh, some locals who do give tours. Actually, there's several companies that give tours. There's like locals who will just like show you the stuff. You can actually have vacation rentals in the area. And then there are the professional tour companies that charge people hundreds of dollars and put up no trespassing signs to stop other people coming in. 
It is important to remember, though, that this is, you know, essentially a residential neighbourhood. Sure, they were large one-acre lots, but people were living here when the fissure opened up. So it was a series of fissures, actually, that ran sort of southeast away from the volcano. This was called the East Rift Zone. And in some areas, they just start opening up and they, you have small patches. And then you got down to Fissure 8 and it just turns into a giant lava field. But there are people still living in some of these areas, some of these houses that have been spared the most of the damage. And if you walk around the neighbourhood, there are lots of signs for private property, even on the properties that are destroyed. I mean, yeah, people still own this land, although many have sold to government programmes uh, designed to help people who have had a volcano open up underneath their house. So this is us basically going next door, and this is one of the flows, right? Right. So it was a chain of fissures yeah. running off in one direction, and this is what we got. I know that basically they'd filled the lava lake at the top of Kilauea, and then it began to just drain out, and they weren't sure where it was going initially. Right, but there was lava coming out down here. Right, and so it came out down here. That was why it was... That wall was there. Like, that wall made it. <laughs> oh yeah, there's an actual handmade lava wall in there. That has a it's water heater there. there. There's a water heater back there, so right? There's probably a lot of things in there. I'd really fat be interested to do archaeology underneath lava flows. Oh, there's a barbecue still sitting there as well. Yeah, I think that was nice there. Nice gas after. grill. Could be. So yeah, basically this road was uh, had lava on it, and it's just they yep, they, they just scraped it off, broke it up, and it's a road again. One of the starkest examples of the sort of your randomness with which this destruction was laid out was this house, which has somebody living in it, and the neighbour where the house was basically destroyed by a fissure opening up underneath it and you know spewing lava. Now. In this case, the house was generally destroyed by the fire, but they did have lava in their garage, which destroyed their cars. And while the rock in the surface has cooled down to manageable levels, there's still a lot of hot rock underneath the surface, and that heat is spreading out sideways and sterilizing the soil that is near to these areas. Around the back of the house, though, they still have a nice lawn there. They do have some problems mowing the lawn because there's a giant fissure in it, which is like eight feet wide near the street. The house is perfectly serviceable. People live there and, you know, they still work on the garden. It just is a garden with some very interesting features in it. But extreme gardening had a place here long before the eruption. There was uh, one nursery here which specialised in carnivorous plants, and apparently it was world famous, renowned, but unfortunately it was right underneath or right on top of where Fisher 8 opened up, and now it is completely buried by the eruption. But the owner still owns the property, and just last year at Christmas, he basically paid some people to bulldoze a road along the original route that the street followed. You can see it in this photo here that was sent to me on Twitter. I mean, seriously, good luck to the person behind this, because you know, that's pretty badass. And conveniently, this road also makes it quite easy to get close to Fisher 8, uh, because you know this is a hazardous area. Some of the places are collapsing. On one side, it was all lava flows, and that stuff uh, has its own texture. But on the side you tend to approach it from, these are tephra fields. This is where the lava has been fountaining up in the air and then hardening and then falling back down. And it falls like, you know, snow. And if you go off of a trail that is well worn, you can very quickly find yourself digging into like two or three feet of basically loosely bound rock. So tephra is basically between volcanic ash, which is very fine, and volcanic bombs, which are like things the size of your fist. These are bits of gravel, bits of other material. It's frequently got a lot of gas in it. It's very light and very fragile, and it comes in a million different colours. Well, maybe not a million, but the mineralogy is really important to figuring out the temperature that the lava was when it was exuded. Also, you'll sometimes find, well, the remains of dead things. Thankfully, there were no human casualties with this eruption, just a lot of properties destroyed and carnivorous plants. Three years on from the eruption, it, there's still a lot of heat here, and 
a lot of that is visible because it's very wet. The rain comes and it seeps into the ground and then comes out in steam vents all over the place. This is a nice aerial video from the US Geological Survey. It's a little old now and you can tell that it's old because the access road that was laid down by Mr. Carnivorous Plants dude isn't actually visible in this. But yeah, you can see the structure is here and that largely hasn't changed. You can see that it has this sort of horseshoe shaped crater rim. The lava would flow out one side and on the other side it would just land and weld itself into a very large uh, structure. And that's what people are climbing up to get a look inside this. This is absolutely wild. I mean, listen, this was a huge vent spewing lava three years ago. And, I mean, odds are, national parks aren't going to let me on this. <laughs> this is probably wild. This is it. That's the actual crater down there. They had lava in there. As it happens, we reached the top around sunset. The light was still good enough to see the, you know, the structure inside, see all the different colors. Also see that the, the floor has, originally it was, you know, liquid lava, but it had frozen up and it actually collapsed in the middle. That's quite common with lava lakes because as the lava drains out underneath, the crust no longer has anything underneath it to support it. And it'll sometimes you'll have these collapsed um, structures or sometimes you'll get things like lava tunnels and stuff like that. Also, I'm noticing a lot of debris has landed on top of the bottom of the crater here. Uh, that would mean that the sides are still sort of collapsing. Now, in that area in the middle, there's green stuff there. I am told that these are ferns, which is quite impressive that, you know, they are already establishing themselves only a couple of years after this has really cooled down. And looking down along the rift, you can see some evidence of fissures one through seven there. The fissures are all numbered in the order that they opened up. And the first group were down there. They ended up being less active. Number eight happened to be the one that was absolutely the, the most dominant. If you look off downstream, then you'll see lots of this lava that has since hardened. It kind of looks like sheets that have been draped over the landscape. And that has flowed over the tephra fields. Now, the tephra tends to only get formed when there's a lot of lava spraying up in the air. And it can be laid out uphill against gravity, whereas the liquid lava, it will flow downhill. It will cover any tephra that's been blown out early on, and it will continue to flow long after the pressure drops below what's required to create lava fountains. So that's why you've got different uh, geology on both sides of this uh, you know, structure. And off to the west, there was another group of uh, fissures that were e evidenced by their steam emissions. Also, thanks to careful planning, when we got up to the top, it was sunset, and it was a spectacular sunset. This is one of these sunsets to remember kind of sunsets, even if it wasn't for the fact that we were standing on top of a very recently formed geological structure in an absolute wilderness of devastation. Now, returning to the top of Kilauea, as uh, the eruption in 2018 drained most of the magma from the mountain, the caldera collapsed and water began to come back in from, you know, leaking in through the ground. And we had a lake form, which uh, was very chemically rich. And towards the end of 2020, a lava lake flowed back in there. This was actually quite surprising because having so much magma drain out of the mountain, it wasn't clear that there'd be any reserves. And when my wife planned the vacation for June, I was really hopeful that I was going to see some more lava flowing on the island. And as luck would have it, have it um, yeah, the magma basically stopped flowing and the crater lake solidified in May. So I missed it by weeks. It wasn't even looking that hot when I got there. But... Make no mistake, even if Kilauea sleeps for a few years or decades, in the long term, it is still going to be very active. In fact, probably the most active volcano in the world. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.